to find out that, in fact, they are not necessarily human, but they are coterie descended from, bloodline descended from, alien visitors from other planets. What? That's right. Alien visitors from other planets who visited our planet approximately between 30 and 50,000 years ago. And their interference in our destiny and the manipulation of history, we all need to really know about. We really have to understand this if we're going to make sense of our world. They, these individuals influenced our culture, our science. For instance, as Lawrence Gardner says, it took man over a million years to progress from using stones as he found them to the realization that they could be chipped and flaked a better purpose. It then took another 500,000 years before Neanderthal man mastered the concept of stone tools, and a further 50,000 years before crops were cultivated and metallurgy was discovered. Hence, he says, by all scales of evolutionary reckoning, we should still be as far removed from any basic understanding of mathematics, engineering, or science, but here we are, a mere 7,000 years later, landing probes on Mars. And he asked the all-important question, so how did we inherit this wisdom, and from whom? And then, just in case, I, again, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but just in case anybody's just straight in off the street and thinks that no alien visitors could ever visit this planet, they better read what uh, Dr. Harrison H. Brown says from CIT. He estimates that virtually every star in our galaxy has a planetary system, in each of which, right, in each of which two or four planets might have an Earth-like environment and chemistry that encourages our kind of life to exist. He gives the enormous figure of 100 billion stars with planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone, and get this, there are 450 billion of those galaxies. If that makes you feel small, good. But we don't have to look to scientists for that. My work is entirely based on the mythologies uh, you know, of the ancient world, the legends. Uh, yeah, they used to say it as old, old wives' tales, so nobody paid it any mind. But we don't have to look to science to, to wait to tell us what the le our forefathers were telling us all along. The scriptures, the apocryphal works, the Gnostic texts. Isaiah 13, they come from a far country, from the end of heaven, to destroy the whole land. Isaiah 6, who are these that fly in a cloud as the doves to their windows? Well, who indeed? They're known by many names all over the culture. Jack Barringer, a researcher in this very subject, who wrote a book called Past Chalk, he says that there, there's at least 30,000 texts, and that's only the texts that are left after all the burnings and purgings. There's still in existence at least 30,000 texts talking about this visitation. And every single culture in the world, almost bar none, reveal them. The Nephilim, the Anakim, the giants, the titans. Uh, the Indians know them as the Nagas. The Irish knew them as the Nadreds, which is a word that means serpent. And more recently, they're known as the Brotherhood of the Snake or the Serpent People. And we'll explain that why, because there's been a lot of disinformation about that uh, from certain people within the research community. We'll clear that one up today, too. The word Nephilim actually, which is the most common name for these individuals. Uh, the etymology of a Nephilim is uncertain, but the following explanations have been advanced. First, it may derive from Nifal, which is a verb, you know, from the verb to be extraordinary or the extraordinary men. It may derive from the verb en Nepal, which means the fallen ones from heaven, supernatural beings, you see, although it could mean morally fallen men. Take your pick. The International uh, Standard Bible Encyclopedia defines it as meaning unnaturally begotten men, you know, bastards from Nepal, abortion or miscarriage. Most modern versions of the Bible have left the word untranslated. The word also may come from Nephel, which means bad or strange birth, as I said, or from Kenephilim, which means the serpents. You turn over a stone somewhere, like lots of researchers do, and they think, I found Atlantis. Every two years you hear somebody's found Atlantis. Atlantis was a, you know, an empire. You can have outposts and bastions in all the corners of the world, but don't then run up for your own aggrandizement and say, oh, no, I found Atlantis. Be specific. From there, they set about making contact with the Earth's indigenous inhabitants. The books of the old world tell us about it. The Bible, Genesis says, the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. Okay, So they even tried to contact, uh, for some reason, uh, best known to themselves, they were interested in the Earth women, only joking. And they tried to get involved with them, as you would. Anyway. The Gnostic texts tell us more about it. They say, now come, let us seize. I like that word, seize. Let us seize her and cast, let us cast our seed on her so that then she is polluted. She will not be able to ascend to her light. But those whom she will beget will serve us. Hmm. Gods need servants now? In the Ethiopia Kebra Nagast, 
this incredible book tells us that the daughters of Cain, with whom the angels had accompanied, conceived. They actually did conceive. But they were unable to bring forth their children, and they died. And of the children who were in their wombs, some died, and some came forth, having split open the bellies of their mothers, they came forth by their navels. So this was some hideous, you know, like rosemary baby pluff. You know, it obviously didn't work very well. You know, another Gnostic text, please do not ask me to pronounce that. The daughters of darkness came, became pregnant as a result of the beauty of the forms of the emissary. As a result of the beauty of the forms of the emissary. That's exactly what Celtic mythology says, that the evil ones were incredibly handsome physically. In fact, in Gaelic, the term we still use today for beautiful, usbre, means beautiful. Uh, they'll see a beautiful child and they go, oh, he's such a bray. All right? That means, and that was the king of the Nephilim you know, from Irish mythology. It's a weird, you know, weird thing. Now, um, they say, that, and the fruits of their bodies fell upon earth and consumed the blossoms of the trees. So then Samyaza, uh, their leader, says to them, we have this quote from the Book of Enoch and so on, I fear ye will not indeed agree to do this deed and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. Now, most scholars think that this sin refers to the physical impregnation we've just been talking about. Actually, sadly, unfortunately for us, the human race, it does not, in fact, mean that. A lot of beings have probably come to this planet and probably still do. They do their little thing. They look at some rocks. They do their research, and then they're gone. They do not violate what Gene Roddenberry called the prime directive. The group that we are going to examine in a minute did do that. But it wasn't just the physical impregnation of the females that is the sin that is involved. That great sin, ladies and gentlemen, which we have to understand, was something else that happened approximately 30 to 50,000 years ago. And it was the transgenic experimentation, the genetic hybridization of our original forefathers that were on this planet. That means, very simply, the crossing of alien DNA. Humanoid, yes, but alien DNA with the, the DNA of our forefathers. In Genesis 1, we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let's not get into that whole thing about the hour right now. That's a, always been a bone of contention. I'd like to explore it, but we haven't got the time. Just let's focus on the fact that it's saying, After our likeness. The gods are making man in their likeness. Corinthians backs this up. We read, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, man, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Two atoms? Well, wait a minute. How come we never learned that in Sunday school? What's this two atoms bit? The spiritual did not come first, says the passage, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. It just sounds unspiritual until you decode it. They're literally telling here that the first man, Adam, was of the earth, and the second one is a creation from up there, from the heavens. He's spiritual. We got That word is so colored that we think it means something holy. It doesn't. It means not of the earth. Another term you might want to use in reference to this is the firstborn. This is a reference to these sons of the serpent, the first you know, beings that they created. This hybrid race, also known, I believe, as the race of the Elohim. So when you hear about the Jehovah's and the Elohim's, that's what you're hearing about. The term that I prefer to use, more modern term in my book, is Homo Atlantis, because this being actually was created on Atlantis. And what a remarkable being indeed. And we're talking to the alien side, it's Mr. Spock, you know, plus thousands of years. Very, very advanced technological beings. And then something else that the alien masters didn't have and probably didn't even understand. The human component, which I believe had the moral sensibility, the violet ray. At least it had the connection to the Earth Mother, the Matrix. A remarkable entity. And we are, in fact, descended from him. George Norrie asked me last night, do you mean that every single per I mean, is there anybody with a pure, you know, human blood? No, they're not. Every single being today has a, a various, uh, you know, cocktail of this. We're going to explore that more in a minute. However, the sons of the serpent, the Elohim, you see, had it all turned on. They were just equally intelligent, and I believe they're actually a little bit more, you know, grounded and intelligent than even their masters. So to cut a very long story short, they decided that, wait a minute, wait a minute, this servitude bit, no, no, we're not into that gig. We want to, you know, blow this status quo. So after, an undiscern, un, un, uh, after an undiscernible time, undisclosed time, they decided to exodus. They tr decided to leave the continent of Appalachia, to vacate. And they did so, and they set up their own base on another continent on our planet at that time, which was known as Oceania, or better known as Lemuria. 
and they set up their own thriving culture there. And many of the scholars who look into this say that it's all the high culture, you know, the Mozarts, the Beethovens, the, the Salvador Dali's, the whatnot. That's where that's coming from. Okay. Lemuria is an interesting name. Etymology tells us an awful lot. It means the land ancestral, land of the ancestors from Mu or Muha Devi, the Hindu mother goddess. This goddess was the personification of Lemuria itself, the motherland of humanity. Shiva, her counterpart, the great father of humanity. An Indian uh, Tamil text, the Silabhadarkan, says that uh, describes a lost continent in the Pacific and Indian Ocean. It calls the Kamai Nadu or the Kamari Kandam. That is, means the dragon land of the immortal serpent. There's that word again. The rebellion and exodus of the sons compelled the Atlanteans to return to their drawing boards. They began a second major hybridization program and created a Mark II being that we can call Adamic. These beings were of both sexes, uh, but in the beginning they could not reproduce. They made excellent servants in the garden. Ancient chronicles, ancient texts, and sources. We know that when the conquistadors got to South America, you know, uh, Zamoraga and uh, these uh, bishops and cardinals were just burning and desecrating the ancient chronicles all over the world, but they especially did it in South America. I want to share with you a caption from a Mexican codice. He's one of the remaining books, and it's the Popol Vuh. It's one of only two, like the Dresden Codex, the Popol Vuh. I think that's about it, basically, that survived. I want to read this with you, and again, if this is any example of what these many burned books contained, and I do believe it is, we can understand why they were burned. The Popol Vuh says, and this is the God speaking, let us make him who shall nourish and sustain us. What shall we do to be invoked, to be remembered in earth? We have tried with our first creatures, but they, uh, we could not make them venerate us. So then let us try to make obedient, respectful beings who shall nourish and sustain us. Now the question immediately arises, why would gods need uh, you know, servants to nourish and sustain them? And what's this bit about the first creatures who wouldn't and the second ones who would? If this is an example of what was in those ancient books, we have now a, a handle on why it was so important for the ruling dynasties of the more you know, later times to get rid of them. Same thing happened in Ireland, desecrations untold. And not only of books. In the Babylonian account, man is to be merely a slave brought into being by Marduk at the plea of the defeated rebel gods, so that those gods themselves need not be subjugated to servile labor. Man would be a puppet, a lowly primitive creature. The epic of Atrahasis, which dates to about 1630 BC, found in the Assyrian Library of Nineveh. I'm sure Zachariah knows all about that book. He, it says that in a similar vein to the Enuma Elish, one of the main ideals is to show why man was created by the gods. It was so that they themselves need not work on the earth to produce their own food. Now, the alien geneticists did not desire a repeat of their first experiments. They realized that the error, you see, the first time, the error had centered on the intelligence of their Mark I experiment. Therefore, in the Mark II experiment, Adamic man's intelligence would be confounded. Adamic man's intelligence would be confounded. Well, we hear about that, but we don't know we're reading it. Because the euphemism that has been used for that state of dumb-downness is the word naked. So just remember, when you read the word naked in the Bible or the other apocryphal works, that Adam and Eve were sent into the garden naked, please understand that it is a euphemism for being in a state of intellectual, psychological ignorance. It, means not, it doesn't make any sense in the world to think of it uh, you know, as physical nakedness. They were in a dumbed-down state. Well, listen, you can sit in a laboratory now, you know, or half an hour, they'll stick a few probes in your brain, and you'll be, you'll be naked, you'll be dumbed down. They can do it in half an hour. Think what you could do if you had the power of the genome and the cell and the mitochondria. <sighs> no problem. Genesis 3 says, By the sweat of thy face will be thy bread. This is God, by the way. This is your, your God talking to his creations. By the sweat of thy face will be thy bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust thou art, and to dust thou wilt return. They give you the same line when they're putting you in the, in, the dirt, in the dirt now. When you go to a funeral, perk up, listen to that. And listen to the condescension that's behind it. My father died, he's not dust. Your parents have died, they're not dust. Who is this that calls our parents and the fallen of our planet the dust? Genesis 11 says, and the, and the Lord said, Look, the people are united and they all have but one language. Come on, let us go down and therefore confound their language so that they cannot understand one another's speech. 
Again, this is an oft-quoted and oft-researched passage. But it, the language is not verbal. All right? This is the language of the chemical soup. Now, thank God, we've, you know, we've, we've come far. We can look back at this and understand it. This is the symbiotic, spiritual language that's being confounded. Genesis 3.22, and that number 3.22 is a very important number to secret societies, by the way. In Genesis 3.22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand to take off the tree of life, we better get down there and do something. This is an implication that the first cre creatures did have full knowledge of good and evil, but this time that would not be permitted. So they you know, had to do something. That term tree of life, by the way, is a term that relates to the DNA. DNA was known in the ancient times. I know most people don't believe that that's possible, but it, it was. The only thing was that they did not you know, portray or think of DNA as this sort of weird Lego set floating in hyperspace that they per perpetually show you today on TV. They had a much more organic notion of it. It was a tree of 22 branches and roots with its you know, roots in the earth and its branches in the heavens. It's the same symbol on the two coiling serpents because they understood that it had a serpentine look. And this is probably a good juncture as to explain why the term serpent was used. It's not because they look like serpents. They look humanoid. The Semitic word for serpent is Nahash. And that word also has a second meaning of, of discovery, to find out. So evidently, this refers to science. Therefore, the Nephilim were super scientists. And the term serpent stuck because that's what it means. In Genesis 2, it says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You see on the God who's doing this, you see what? The twin serpents of the DNA. You always see that if you look at the great mythologies of the world. The Indian shamans, Native American shaman, using the double the serpents. In that previous picture, you not only saw the twin serpents, but you saw this thing that all the gods of Egypt hold. It's called the Ankh. And everybody, but everybody's got a theory about the Ankh. You know, it's meant to be breath, it's meant to be life, it's meant to be the union of opposites. And of course that's true. But actually, ancient people like Hebrew and the ancient languages did not use vowels. So we have many words come down to us that use only strong consonants, or what would have passed for consonants. consonants. The word Ankh, by the way, if you add in the other sound values, is actually the word an nu, right? N k nak he. So just know from now on that the unk, if you if you see the god holding the unk, it literally is the composite word of the word anunaki, which is known as the word for the fallen angels or the, the gods from on high, ananaje, the heavenly serpents. So that, that's what the unk really stands for. But we find serpent symbols all over the place. We find them in the modern milieu as well. We find words of power that we don't don't mean anything in English. But until you discover what is being said. What is the serpent that encoils euroborically? What is the pentium, the room of the five, or the serpentium? We have symbolism that has always troubled me. We've got Knights of Templar crosses, Maltese crosses. We've got green, green dragons crowned, devouring human beings. Where do these symbols come from? Why are they being used? The, the, the uh, Italian Prime Minister Berlusconi, here's his house. Instead of having a, you know, a paddling pool for the kiddies out in the front garden, no, he prefers a black serpent eating a human being. <laughs> I'd love to hear the story that he tells you when you ask him, uh, you know, hey mate, where you, where you got that you know, black serpent in the garden that's eating a fella, you know? He goes, oh, you know, it's a tattoo. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, even the positioning of these people's houses are on special vortexes. There's a subject that's very important to understand related to archaeoastronomy and, and, and geomancy about why, like the ancient fathers did this. They put symbols in the earth, did they not? Well, it's happening again. Freemasonry, uh, we looked at the compass and the G earlier on, and of course, researchers are always telling you the G represents, oh, it's God, it's Gaia, it's geometry. No, it's not. The lowercase g, when it's done like that, is a little cryptic anagram for the serpent. That's why it's there. Because the Masons, now being infiltrated and so forth, right, are doing the work. That's why George, there's lots of kings called George. The Georgus, St. George and the Dragon. Right? George and the Dragon, not James and the Dragon or Johnny and the Dragon. It's George and the Dragon. Because the g is important. 
Don't believe me? Think I'm making it up? They're happy to tell you. There is the serpent, G, in connection to the gene trust. And they're asking you to be a part of history. Yeah, their history. But we have to get symbolically literate because they're showing you ancient symbols out of the world of religion and theocracy and theology, right? Always when they're dealing with high-end science. We just think it's a cute design and don't think of it anymore. But everywhere you see something spiritual, it's always alongside high technology, right? Every time you see something about genes, it's some meditation pose or spirituality. Every time you see the DNA, they're talking serpents and trees. Here's the one for the countdown of war, the latest war, when uh, war was declared on Iraq recently. This is the cover of Time magazine. They're calling it a special report. But on the front cover, you don't see troops and, you know, and tanks and whatnot. What do you actually see? Right? Here we have countdown to war, but we get the main story is solving the mysteries of DNA. We're going to find out what the connection is, but look at the symbolism. Solving the mysteries of DNA, and they're showing you from the book of Genesis. The tree of life, the primal parents, and the, and the DNA serpentine spiral. Do they know something we don't know? Now, the Lemurians, or the sons of the serpents, became aware of their creator's second experiments, you see. See, on Lemuria, this other coterie of basically enlightened beings, they're not dumb, you know. They're watching their forefathers on Atlantis, thinking they might get up to this. So the Lemurians actually do become aware of their creator's second experiments. Now they have a dilemma, realizing that the race of uh, Adam, you see, was in fact kindred to themselves. They both possessed the human DNA. It was therefore decided that representatives would be sent to Atlantis to dialogue with the enslaved and dumbed down Adams and Eves. Thus we have the story, corrupted later, of the serpent entering the garden. So the book of Genesis is completely upside down. Completely upside down. And if you study the artwork of the great masters who knew what we're talking about today, you will see in their symbolism of the androgynous serpent and how he's trying to free, as opposed to tempt anyone. Now, the story goes, you see, that the um, sons entered into the gardens and spoke with their genetic cousins. They counseled them to throw off their chains of servitude and accompany them back to Lemuria, where they would be initiated into all that had been hidden from them. It is written that the atoms were resistant to the invitation. Right? The, the atoms were not, just not getting it. But fortunately, the responses of the Eves was different. The ancient mythologies talk about that the Eves were mysteriously attracted to these visitors and were heeding them and are basically responsible for this exodus. This is very much important to know because it ties into why women have been marginalized henceforth. In fact, Madame Blavatsky puts it this way. She says, the appellation Satan, that means the word Satan in Hebrew, belongs by right to the first and cruelest adversary of all other gods, Jehovah, and not in the serpent which spoke only words of sympathy and wisdom. How right she is. And in book of Genesis, we hear the hatred, you see, towards the female for doing this. This caption that we're going to read now is meant to be to the serpent, but it is not. It is to somebody else. And it says, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou wilt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Women committed a certain crime, quote unquote, 13,500 years ago for which they have never been forgiven. That is why they have not held any office worth anything. Don't be fooled by what you see on the, today's history books. As Leonard Schlein puts it, when we look back across the historical time of patriarchy, there seems to be some terrible inevitability, a relentless desire to crush the female essence. And he, said, he admits it. This is a top scientist from San Francisco. But he admits it. The question of why is one of the most puzzling of our time. So we come full circle. What does this have to do with the origins of evil? In the preface of the Atlantis book, it says, during the next 10 years, the human race is destined to finally discover the, origin, the true origins and destiny. As part of this discovery, we have to address the overwhelmingly important question of how the phenomena of evil came into the world and into the consciousness of Earth's human inhabitants. What we need to reveal now and understand is that it is this genetic transgenic experimentation. It is exactly the consequences of this uh, experimentation that caused what we now call in the, the evil to come into existence. It's time for that fact to be known. <laughs> it's not nature that did it. Nature was in perfect balance from the, high, from the biggest neutron star to the smallest quanta. In fact, Leonard Schlein, uh, talking about uh, this, recounts Plato 
and we read something absolutely remarkable, which has meaning for everyone here. Zeus gathered the gods in council to express his concern that these unusual creatures would one day challenge their hegemony. He was loath to exterminate them with his thunderbolts, though, because there would be no one to bring the gods' offerings. You know, no hot coffee in the morning, no remote control for the TV, and it sucks, you know. He solved the problem by putting each creature into a trance and then splitting it down the middle. Upon awakening, each half only dimly remembered what it had been prior to being cleft in two. Zeus explained to the assembled gods and goddesses the cleverness of his scheme. These creatures would no longer pose a threat to the gods because they would dissipate their considerable energy by spending the rest of their days searching for their missing halves. Does that sound familiar? Leonard Schlein goes on to say in another book, Eve's descendants have steadily accumulated the power to destroy each other in an unholy Armageddon, and like sleepwalkers are shuffling towards a planetary ecological disaster. How could a slight five-foot-tall, two-legged animal create such sublimity and then wreak so much havoc in so minuscule an interval uh, in Earth's history? I actually believe that be because of this utterly, incredibly devastating effect on our biology, that the Lemurians, trying to offset the worst of that, trying to, you know, after the Adams and Eves went to Lemuria, and the promise was that they tried to condition out the alien DNA, or even maybe even genetically, again, doubly interfere now, and try to remedy the problem. But I actually believe, just for your interest, because I know many of you are into the mystical tradition, I also believe, and we can talk about this later, that the yogic systems actually probably date from the time of Lemuria. They may have been devised for the express purpose of combating the alien proclivities or for conditioning out the alien DNA. These problematic yogic processes were merely one of the methods, one of the methods chosen to deal with his biological and uh, psychological legacy. Basically, yoga had to do with cleansing and hygiene. It didn't have to do with meeting God and sitting at the right hand of Jesus and all that stuff. It had to do with cleaning your psyche. Many of the practices of yoga, which means to link back or tie together, make greater sense when understood in this context. It's just an interesting thing.